Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. As the days go by, I'm seeing a few more downloads. Uh, thank you so much. Just remember that we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, um, Google, Amazon Music, TuneIn. Wherever you get your podcast, there's uh, Let's Talk Micro. So those of you that have listened, thank you so much for the support. You can also find me on Instagram, Let's Talk Micro. And you can also find me on Twitter, Let's Talk Micro 1. So please go ahead and follow me. I post pictures and I do a lot of promo for the podcast. But I do put pictures. And then speaking of Twitter... Um, I saw a post today about Pastorella multocida, how it can, uh, you know, causes wounds and cellulitis from cats and dog bites. It may also lead to sepsis, pneumonia, or meningitis in immunocompromised patients. Oxidase positive and indole positive. There was a reply from a, from what I guess is a tech, saying that uh, when I see gram-negative cocobacilli growing on blood, growing on chocolate, not growing on Mac, I start thinking of pastorella. And please um, bear with me as I record this. Uh, there's some bad weather, so if you hear that in the background, my apologies. I've been trying to wait for like the, the perfect moment for it to calm down, but it doesn't seem that's going to happen. So, But yeah, with pastorella, I don't know, it's, it's just my favorite. I mean, yes, it's bad for the patients, of course. As a micro nerd, it's exciting. Uh, You have, it's indole and oxidase positive. Most organisms, you know, they tend to be one or the other. Like your enterobacteriaceae, they're oxidase negative. You know, pseudomonas is oxidase positive, but it's indole negative. So, however, pastorella is is, positive for both. Also, you know, it's normal flora in cats, dogs, and pigs. So we do see a lot of multiceta which is normal flora of cats and dogs. We see canis, which is normal flora in dogs. Those we tend to see a fair amount in the lab, the other ones to a lesser extent. But what that tech said, you know, that's good. When you're working in the lab and you see that presentation, it's always good to have pastorella in the back of your mind. It's very common. So you can definitely, you're definitely going to see it. So keep that in mind. So, um, what did we talk about last week? Well, once again, I hope you all had a great week. So, on the last episode, I talked about blood culture gram stains. I went over how blood cultures are collected, what makes them flag positive in automated systems. Do you remember that? So, basically, CO2 is produced by bacteria that causes a change in the pH which it can be detected by, you know, like a colorimetric method method, or a fluorescent method. And then I also went over how long we incubate the bottles for. If you have bacteria, for bacteria it's five days, what I mean with the length. If at five days is negative, at that point in time you can go ahead and result it as no growth in five days. If you have fungi, it's 28 days. If you have mycobacterium, it's 42 days. And I also went over regular gram stains versus blood culture gram stains. What are the differences? Well, for once, we don't report the cellular elements. When you have a gram stain, you talk about your PMNs, your neutrophils, and you do see them in your blood cultures, and you use them as an indicator of your stain, but you do not report them. So then you look at your organism and you will report them report it with your your morphology, your cellular arrangement, your gram reaction. Always, if you're not sure, call the gram variable. Um, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, the shape, maybe the patient is on antibiotics, the morphology, um, and then we can not even tell what it is. So I have been in situations where the culture has to be released as gram variable organism. 
it's not ideal. You should always try. You should always try your best. But unfortunately, in some situations, it happens. And I also talked about how block cultures are critical values. Whereas on your regular gram stains, your cerebrospinal fluids are critical values. Your blood culture is always critical. And a critical value, it's a value that a result that you have to call as soon as you receive it. It's of critical significance for the patient. And there's a specific format that uh, go ahead, if you don't remember, go ahead and listen to episode four, where I go over it in detail. So we've been talking about objectives that we use in micro, right? For gram stains, we use 10x, which is the low power. We focus on our cellular elements and organisms. And I mentioned that if you have a hard time focusing, a good tool is to focus on the lettering on the slide. For example, uh, Sysmex, you know, they make slides. So the slides on the frosted area, they say Sysmex or close to it. So you can focus on that lettering and then go over the area where you inoculate it, bring that into focus, and then switch it to 100x. I mean, that's something that you can do. I mean, a lot of times, if you get it on focus and then you switch to 100x and you don't see anything, check if your slide is upside down. It happens a lot. Don't worry about it. And we use the 100x, which is the oil immersion. So microscopes, they have a 50x, which is helpful, especially for yeast. It's oil immersion as well. So 10x and 100x. And we've been over some tips that when you cannot focus, right? So your 10x to get it into focus, your 100x, which is the oil immersion, is to you can actually see your organisms and your cellular elements and tell them apart. Um, if you bring it to that point of 100x where you can't see anything, make sure your slide is right side up. Uh, focus on the lettering and then the area where you inoculate it. Maybe that helps. And if after all of that, you still can't see anything, you might have just washed away. And then at that point in time, you need to remake your slide. It happens. These are just some good tools to have in your belt whenever, you, especially when you're a student. You know, it is frustrating. You're trying to complete your assignments on time, and then you can focus on your slides. I get it. Yeah, it's frustrating. So it's kind of good to keep this in mind. That way, as soon as you don't see anything, start those steps. And also, in addition, you know, the 10 and 100x condenser and light are up. Bring them up. Of course, you know, with the light adjusted to your sensitivity. Of course, you know, some people can, they want it brighter than others, depending on your eyes. And that's completely fine. So now that you're experts on the low power, 10x, all immersion, 100x, today I want to talk about the 40x, the high dry objective. Right? You don't use it as much as your other two, but you still use it. This is a very popular objective in your analysis. This is what I was mentioning that sometimes, you know, students, they're taking their urinalysis class and their micro and they keep confusing the objectives. So on the urinalysis, you perform your, micros your macroscopic exam by dipping a dipstick in the urine. You have some automated instruments that do that for you. Then you spin it down for your microscopic exam. So like I said, opposed to the 100x for this objective, we need the condenser down and we need less light. And that's why med tech students sometimes, you know, they have a hard time and you end up getting your 40x putting oil on it. Hey, you know, it happens. If that happens, just please clean it. So what do we use 40x in micro for? Well, we use it for wet mounts, which brings the question, what is a wet mount? Well, it's a technique used to visualize the presence and arrangement of flagella to identify motility. And that brings us to the next question. 
what is motility? Well, motility is defined as the movement of bacteria by means of flagella. This is a very simple procedure. You know, we add a drop of saline to a slide, and textbooks, uh, they also say add water. Then you add your colonies and mix it. Place a cover slip and look at it under 40x. If modal, you should see movement across your field of view. So what do we use motility for in the lab? Well, listeria has one. What do we know about listeria, right? Gram positive run, catalase positive. Um, you can find it in cold cuts, like cheese, because it likes, it survives the cold. It can cause bacteremia, stillbirth, bacterial meningitis. You know, and if you morphology, it's morphology, it, it looks kind of like a group B strap. But of course, this is a group, a gram positive rod. And it's catalase positive versus group B strep is gram positive cocci. And it's catalase negative. So I mentioned meningitis and stillbirth. And this is very important. This is why if you have a newborn and you get a blood culture, and you see tiny gram positive rods, you need to rule out uh, listeria. That's very important. And you have some PCR methods and you have nucleic acid methods where you actually put the blood in there and you get an ID fairly quick, about two and a half hours. But it needs to be ruled out. And you know, something interesting about listeria of course, you know, let's talk micro. I talk about my experiences. Um, a few years ago, I, start, or I, start, I started seeing some gram positive ruts in adults. So, if you know listeria, how it looks on a gram stain, they're like short gram positive ruts. I started seeing in adults atypical morphology, longer rods within 24 hours of the blood culture being collected, you know, flax is positive. And the one time we did, you know, look, I looked at it at the, in the microscope. The morphology didn't look like hysteria, but just in case, you know, we did a nucleic acid method. We used the Luminex, no relation to the podcast. The ID came back as listeria. So, it didn't correlate with the morphology. And before I go down this road, let me tell you another story. There was one case once many years ago where the morphology of the of the organism, it seemed like it was maybe like a cocci, not quite rod. And uh, uh, Luminex was done and the ID came back as hysteria. So the listeria never grew. It was never isolated from any of the plates. So we have to be careful, you know, listeria gets reported to the state, um, but it, it couldn't be recovered on, on, on lager. Um, some of the systems, you know, they have, sometimes, you know, they have some cross reactivity that some bacteria might cause it to falsely ID as others. But going back to the patient, with the 24 hours. So I didn't trust the idea at the time. So it was plated. Uh, when it grew on the plate, then it looked like your typical listeria down to the gram stain. So after that time, we started being more careful. And then it was decided that if you get gram positive rods at 24 hours, you should do an ID on it just to rule out listeria. Yeah, so that was an interesting story. So this organism, you know, exhibits and what it's called an end-to-end -end or tumbling umbrella pattern. So you can see this using the in the wet mount. And there's also an agar, motility agar, where you can actually, you know, you stab the agar, and then you stay with you stay with that same line that you stab it. 
and you should see the growth and it does look like an umbrella when it works when it works well of course so what about bacillus and motility so what do we know about bacillus well you have some bacillus species that are skin flora they're non-pathogenic you have bacillus cereus which is the one that causes the the food poisoning the fried rice poisoning and bacillus has definitely a family member that's very bad. As you know, do you know which one it is? Bacillus and thracis. Horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. You know, the spores can survive for a long time. It is used in bioterror attacks. Well, in the lab, when you have bacillus, and this is especially true for blood cultures, well, you observe for hemolysis. That's the first thing, and um, so if it's hemolytic, it's not in traces. Uh, so at that point in time, you go ahead and you do your catalase, which should be positive. Document that the gram stain was gram positive rods, and then you can release it as bacillus species, not in traces. Well, if it's non hemolytic, you need to rule out in traces because in traces is non hemolytic. So one of the tests that you do, it's motility. And thracis is non-modal. So this can be done uh, you know, a number of ways, but we do use the motility test with the, with the wet mount. So you can actually inoculate nutrient media, such as TSB, that's tryptocase soy broth, and you incubate it for 24 hours. And then after that, uh, you go ahead and, and look at it under the microscope using the 40X with the cover slip. Well, sometimes, you know, there's a, I learned from some of the older texts, you know, the season texts, that if you put it on the TSB for about two hours, maybe three, you can actually see the motility. And that has been very helpful. You put it there for three hours, you take it out, you look at it, and then you can see. I mean, you have to make sure that you see the motility, so you see the movement across your field of view. You know, that's important. So, and then after that, you successfully rule it out, and you can report it as bacillus species, not anthracis. So that's how you rule it out right pretty neat another um way that the 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 wet mount is helpful in the lab it's when you are trying to well when you have white colonies and i have mentioned this before but i will mention it again do not assume that because white colonies that you know they're not growing on mac that it's a cog negative stamp that is gram positive cocci uh, that will take you down a wrong path. Sometimes, you know, uh, if you set up a gram positive carn with like a gram positive rod, thinking that it was a, a GPC, it will give you an ID, which is Cocuria Christine. And this is for the Vitec, no affiliation to the podcast. So, you know, a quick tool is doing a gram stain. If you want to rule out yeast, so, however, you know, a wet mount is it's just as good. You can see the cocci well, you can see the rods well, you can see the yeast well. So at that point in time, you see the white colonies. Um, you go ahead and do a wet mount. All right, confirm that's cocci. Or if you see that's rods, that's yeast, then that changes the plan, right? You know, if it's yeast, you have to go ahead and Depending on the place, some places can, can based on the morphology, release it as like yeast, not candida albicans. I mean, nowadays with the Molotov, you can do a quick ID. But the thing is that you cannot assume that it's a gram positive cocci. Depending on the source, all of these, you know, they have different implications, right? A yeast is pathogenic. You can have a gram-positive rod 
like in the urine, which is normal genital flora. Uh, but then, you know, CNS can be pathogenic in the urine, depending if it's pure, depending if you have staph saprophyticus. So do not assume. I mentioned that the gram stain is such a helpful tool, and so is, so is the wet mount. Another thing that you can do with the wet mount is sometimes, like I mentioned, gram positive rods, flora. So if you have white colonies, you're on the urine bench, you know, you do a quick wet, wet mount. You see your rods, you know, it's normal genital flora. You see cocci, uh, evaluate is it pure? Is this a young female? You know, is it white? Because as we know, if it's a cocci, Staphylococcus saprophyticus causes UTIs, which is urinary, urinary tract infections, and in young females. So, but if it's a raw, then you go ahead and it's just, it just skin flora. Well, the same with the white colonies, you can do it with the alpha colonies. And at this point in time, do you remember when I say alpha, uh, beta, what I'm talking about? Should we review it? You know what? Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. So what is hemolysis, right? Hemolysis is lysis of red blood cells in the agar. So you have three types, alpha, which is partial hemolysis, giving the media like a greenish color. You have beta, which is complete lysis. It's clear see-through. And this is one true for like strep pyogenes, uh, sometimes your strep C, with your streptococcus B or your agalactiae. Um, sometimes, you know, you can be kind of weak. Um, yeah, not as strong as group A. And don't worry when I'm talking about group A, group B. There's definitely going to be an episode where I talk about that. What, you know, what's the A and what's the B? You know, Staph aureus, beautiful hemolysis, beta. And then when you talk about gamma, it's no lysis. So there's no change. And that's why when you refer to like um, Enterococcus faecalis, it has a gamma hemolysis. So there's no change. However, another species of Enterococcus, Enterococcus facium, has alpha hemolysis. So you see the little gray colonies and you see like a green ring around them. And that's alpha hemolysis. So you have alpha colonies. And this is very helpful when you're in the urine bench. Right? A quick wet mount can let you know if you have long, thin rods. And what do you think about when you, think, when you hear long, thin rods? Right, alpha hemolysis. What are you thinking about? Lactobacillus, normal genital flora. Uh, having that flora, you know, it's part of that good flora, which you need. That way, other organisms don't don't take over. I mean, we see this, especially like in the female population. You have when your normal flora starts to decrease. That's when yeast and other organisms take over. So that's why, you know, they recommend that to eat the yogurt and the probiotics with that good bacteria. So you can build up those healthy levels. So you have that, you have those alpha colonies, you do a quick wet mount. And then you see the long thin runs, normal flora. And this is especially true when you have an, an elderly patient. Do you know why? It's so important. What are you trying to make sure you don't miss when you have alpha colonies on an elderly patient? Well, Aerococcus urinae, right? Aerococcus urinae is a gram positive coccyne clusters that can uh, cause UTIs in elderly patients. 
So you have alpha colonies, very typical. Very typical scenario on a 70, 80 year old patient. A lot of times, you know, it has it with another pathogen. Like it's very typical for you to have uh, E. coli and Aerococcus urinae growing in the same culture. It's very common. So then think about this. So you have an 80 year old, you have alpha colonies, you do a wet mount, and you see long thin rods. Well, then you rule out Aerococcus urinae. Um, but if you see the coccine clusters, which to be honest, sometimes to me, it can be a little hard to appreciate on the wet mount. I mean, but if you work in a large facility where you have like a moldy top, you can have an ID in the same day. You can, so go ahead and do that. But even if you cannot tell well if it's, like I mentioned, the indirect smears, a lot of times you cannot appreciate the clusters or the chains. So in that case, if you have an elderly patient, go ahead and do an ID like a Vitec or I'm not too much up to date on the micro scan. But go ahead and do that. Um, in the pre moldy tough days, you know, you saw gram positive coccine clusters, you did a PYR. If it was negative, then you still had to rule out Aerococcus urinae. If it was positive, then at that point in time, you probably had Aerococcus viridens, which is normal flora. And then at that point in time, you didn't have to do anything else. But nowadays, with the moldy tough and you know, excuse me, you young generations out there. Um, sometimes, you know, younger techs, they don't want to do biochemicals. Like, why go through all that trouble uh, if you can get an ID fairly quickly? Well, you know, I will address that in, in another episode. But for now, that's the way that Aerococcus used to be worked. So it's easier that way, you know, you save some time, you don't waste supplies. If you see those clusters on your, on your wet mount, then at that point in time, you know, do your other biochemicals and then roll it out. So, so as you can see, there's, it's the wet mount, it's useful. And I also want to address, you know, I'm, I want to circle back a little bit about when you do the wet mount and you see your yeast. Um, so I've been mentioning the Molditoff a lot. Those of you that are familiar with the Molditoff, and I will talk about it at a later episode, but basically it's a form of, of mass spec and, and you get an ID fairly quickly. So there's, there are different procedures to set up yeast versus bacteria on the Molditoff. So by also knowing that with a quick wet mount, which it doesn't take long. Right, apply a drop of saline, put your colonies, cover slip, look, you're done. A minute at the most. So by, by going through those steps, then you know in which direction to go. It makes it clear. What I don't want you to do is go ahead and, without doing a gram stain, and do or doing a wet mount, set up both procedures. Meaning, just to kind of rule both of them on the Molitov, don't do that. That's just very wasteful. And those of you that work with the Molitov know what I'm talking about. I will address that later. But that helps you. It points you in the right direction. So all these things I've been talking about, gram stain, wet mount, these are tools that you can have. And it definitely, they, they are so important. They are so fast and they help you in making a diagnosis. So what did we go over today, right? So we addressed the, the, the 40X. We talked about the 40X objective. Also, how important it is. Even though you use the 10X and the 100X a lot, the 40X, you know, it's, it's helpful also to get IDs to point you in the right direction. So it's also an important part of your tools as a microbiologist. And then we you know we talked a little bit about listeria and you know about motility and what are you looking for, different ways of doing motility. 
and how you need that to actually rule out bacillus and thrasis. Very important. I mean, even though, and I hope, I mean, thankfully, we rarely get it in the lab, but we still need to rule it out. We need to be prepared. So by doing that motility on a non-hemolytic bacillus species, if it's modal, you rule it out. If it's not modal, at that point in time, consult with a more senior technologist, start sealing your plates, and start working on your sentinel protocol. But yeah, there you have it. Um, it's a fairly common test used in the lab. I mean, you need it for your bacillus, and it helps you, you know, to point point you in the right direction, whether it's a yeast or cocci or a rot. They will have different implications. Sometimes, you know, like I said, rots and cocci are flora. So it's definitely a good tool to use. So all of you students out there, please remember that. And even you techs that have been working on the bench sometimes might think, oh, do I have to do this? Uh, yes, you do. Remember, we do all we can for our patients. That's what it's all about. And that, my dear audience, is the end of this episode. Once again, I hope you enjoyed listening to me talking about the 40x objective. You know, it's been great. As more and more of you start listening to this, I am thankful. So stay motivated. Keep bringing that passion to your job. Remember, more motivated the better job we do and it's all about our patience but as a micro nerd coming into a mound of plates is just exciting so all of you microbiologists keep bringing that motivation that passion into your work and continue talking micro i hope you have a great week and until next time